Hi, I'm Denver Snuffer. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. It's the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to introduce Denver Snuffer. He's the founder of a new movement called the Remnant Movement. In our first conversation, we're going to learn about a new set of scriptures that he has for his group. So it's going to be a fun conversation. Check out our conversation. Before we get to that, I just wanted to mention one more thing. As you know, Gospel Tangents has teamed up with the Dialogue Podcast Network. We can now be heard on Lyceum.fm. That's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M. So you can hear all your favorite podcasts, such as the Dialogue Podcast Network, Gospel Tangents, Beyond the Block, and Mormon News Report. So if you want to hear all of us, and we release every few days, so you'll get a lot of updates. So go to Lyceum.fm and subscribe there. Now back to our conversation. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm really excited to have... uh, a wonderful guest here in the restoration movement. Could you go ahead and tell us who you are? Uh, Denver Snuffer. Denver um, Snuffer. Reluctant interviewee. <laughs> been been persuaded by um, by the promises that you made of remuneration. <laughs> <laughs> remuneration yeah. in heaven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I don't like doing interviews. But um, after the request was made, I watched a few of the interviews that you've done. And I communicated with uh, Lindsay um, Hanson Park, yeah. and um, the style of interview that you have really doesn't seem to have an agenda. You're just interested in letting people talk. I watched her interview. I watched Michael Quinn's. Um, so yeah, this uh, this is one of those rare occasions where I'm I'm willing to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I feel really lucky. I'm, I'm excited to have you on. So this is fantastic. So um, it, how would you introduce yourself? Or, I mean, I, I think some people would call you a prophet. Is, is that a title you accept or, or how do you, how does that? Well, I, I, there's a whole lot of baggage that is accumulated around the idea of some title, some honorific title. And the trappings that go along with those kinds of things are unwanted, unwelcomed, and um, I just don't like it. I commented one time that in, in all of Scripture, the use of the term beloved is confined almost exclusively to um, the Savior. It's a sacred uh, appellation, beloved, and um, it gets used by the Lord on rare occasion when he is talking to an individual that um, is in the presence of the Lord and he's being acknowledged or promised something by God. So the appellation, beloved, is is to me inappropriate to use because of its sacred nature outside of talking about the Lord's beloved, which is Christ. Beloved prophet, now you're also going one step further because my understanding of the role of a prophet, um, it's like Joseph said, a prophet is only a prophet when a prophet's doing something that fits within that framework. Um, Anyone can have a revelation, anyone. Um, it's not confined to Christians. It's not confined to uh, denominational leaders. Revelations are available uh, generally to the entirety of mankind in every culture, every religion, um, everywhere around the world. A prophet is someone whose revelation was not intended for necessarily that person, but was intended to be a public message. Almost all revelation is um, individual, personal, and the property correctly belonging to the recipient of that revelation. A prophet's message really doesn't belong to him. In fact, on some occasions, the message a prophet receives is something that he doesn't even understand himself. He's going to have to parse it through and try to untangle the, um, the uh, content to understand it himself. So 
the, the message to a prophet is not personal. It's not directed to merely him. It's a message to the world. So in, in that context, the, the term gets misused a lot, and in particular in this culture, in this geography, uh, implies status, um, control, deference, authority. And I make no claim to authority. I make no claim to preside over anyone. I make no claim to be anything other than a fellow sojourner here trying our best to, uh, to follow God. Um, but you caught me at a fortuitous moment because <laughs> I now have the culmination of years of work by hundreds of volunteers. And, um, and maybe the best way to put a context to me is for me to talk about this. Okay. These are prototypes. It'll go into production, but we now have um, a print copy of a new set of scriptures. There are three volumes. The Old Covenants volume is the Joseph Smith translation of the Old Testament. It begins with Genesis that most LDS people would recognize as the Book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price. Okay. So the, the Joseph Smith translation, Genesis text, begins with uh, the Book of Moses, and then it follows the um, Joseph Smith translation version of the Old Testament to the, uh, to the end. That's all in the first volume called the Old Covenants. So that's basically the Old Testament plus the Book of Moses, basically? Is that right? It's, and Joseph Smith's translation. It's the, um, it's the Old Testament Joseph Smith translation version. Mm -hmm. um, and it's... it's uh, the most accurate version of what Joseph did um, that has ever found its way into print. The reorganized church, now the Community of Christ, published what they called the Joseph Smith Translation. The inspired version, I think, is what they call it. The inspired version of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with that is that it was not entirely complete in that they omitted dozens of things that Joseph had done, but the committee that was responsible for publishing it also inserted things that they thought ought to be in there. Therefore, the, the uh, inspired version in the RLDS is not what you'll find in this. The inspired version, um, we've uh, had people compare with the available material and uh, all of the changes that were omitted are included. All of the additions that were made by others are deleted. And in addition, um, during talks Joseph Smith gave in the Nauvoo era, there were times when he was talking about a passage of Scripture from the Bible. And he would comment that a more correct translation or a more correct reading, and then he would alter the text that he just read out of the Bible. He didn't always do that in the manuscript of the Joseph Smith translation, but all of those Nauvoo-era comments that he made were picked up and were also added, so it's the most complete set. Wow. Joseph Smith also always intended to publish both the New Testament and the Book of Mormon in a single volume. So this, the second, the first volume is called the Old Covenants mm -hmm. because those are the covenants, plural, that went with um, Adam and Enoch and Noah and uh, Abraham and Moses down to the time of Christ. The second volume is called the New Covenants. It's the New Testament and the Book of Mormon. Again, it has the same... Joseph Smith translation version put into it um, with all of the corrections, most complete version. But in addition, we have a different um, Book of Mormon text. The J 
Joseph Smith dictated the translation of the Book of Mormon, and it was written by various scribes, beginning with Emma Smith's handwriting and ending with Oliver Cowdery's handwriting. That material was then used by Oliver Cowdery to make the printer's manuscript. The printer's manuscript was intended to be a faithful copy of the original translation. But we know from a comparison between what has survived of the original and the printer's manuscript that we have 100% of, that Oliver Cowdery made about one and a half copying mistakes per page of the printer's manuscript. That manuscript was then taken to the E.B. Grandin shop, and it was John Gilbert who got hired by E.B. Grandin to typeset the Book of Mormon. Uh, John Gilbert took the printer's manuscript, which has no punctuation on it, and then he punctuated and typeset the Book of Mormon. Um, John Gilbert did what he did in punctuating based upon his understanding of how the words that were on that page should be understood. I've commented, there's been this controversy that has existed in Mormonism, um, scholarly articles being written about how Joseph Smith's uh, understanding of God changed from originally a Trinitarian view into later a different view where there's different personages who belong to the Godhead. And as evidence for Joseph Smith's earlier Trinitarian understanding of uh, the Godhead, they point to the, book, the original Book of Mormon text. Well, the punctuation that was put in by John Gilbert, if you repunctuate it, can change from a Trinitarian view to the later doctrinal view that Joseph Smith um, would, would teach and preach and advocate. I've referred to John Gilbert's use of punctuation. Um, I've coined the term the Trinitarian comma. <laughs> because if you take out some commas or you move them about, you can actually reach exactly the same doctrinal conclusion that Joseph would la later teach simply by repunctuating what John Gilbert did. So in the second volume, what we've done is, I think I, I gave two talks in which I changed the punctuation and showed how you could conform to Joseph's later teachings. I think those got in here. But by and large, as much as possible, punctuation has been removed in order to allow the reader a more uh, independent way of coming to grips with the, uh, the content of the book and to deciding for yourself how best it ought to be understood. Hmm. It's also, um, Joseph made a revision and he was revising again in the 1844 time period, but he revised the Book of Mormon a couple of times uh, while he was still alive. It appears from comparisons that what Joseph was doing in the revisions he was making was trying to take the printed version that we had and make it conform more closely to the original translation, not the printer's manuscript. Errors crept in there. More errors crept in when John Gilbert worked uh, with it. The printed copy was, was after John Gilbert's fingerprints were on it. He took that back to the original um, translation and he tried to correct it to conform back to that. We, um, unfortunately, that original translation got put in the cornerstone of a building. It didn't get pulled out until it had rotted. We only have about 22% of the original left. Um, we have 100% of the printer's copy, but only 22% of the original. And so we don't have the ability to go back and completely conform. But as near as it is possible at this point to recapture that, um, that's the Book of Mormon version that appears in the second volume. Hmm. 
Then the third volume is something called The Teachings and Commandments. Um, it's a cr chronological layout of the revelations given to Joseph Smith with the exception of the Joseph Smith history. Joseph Smith rewrote the history after John Gilbert left the church and took the history with him. Uh, Joseph rewrote the history of the church in 1838. Then he published it in the Times and Seasons when he was the editor of the Times and Seasons, it being based upon the 1838 material because the internal content of the Times and Seasons material is all referencing the 1838 time frame. We don't have that. Um, we do have a copy that was made in 1839, and it was that copy in 1839 that was the basis for the Times and Seasons version. While Joseph Smith was the editor of the Times and Seasons, his history began to roll out it's significantly longer than what is in the Pearl of Great Price Joseph Smith history that Latter-day Saints would be familiar with. But um, the entirety of his history, while it uh, was written and published with him as the editor, appears as the first section of the Teachings and Commandments. Then it follows a chronological layout through all of the revelations of Joseph Smith. Um, and once again, um, we have access to the revelation as Joseph Smith dictated it. The revelations of Joseph went through two iterations that altered the text. A copy was taken by Oliver Cowdery to Independence, Missouri, to be published as the Book of Commandments. Right. Um, Oliver Cowdery, in setting up the Book of Commandments, felt at liberty because there was a revelation about, about Oliver having the right to, to write for the church, but not by way of commandment, yet he could write. He had the liberty, he thought, to alter some of the text and to add to them. So he did that in the Book of Commandments. You know, the press was overrun, it was destroyed. Copies of that got salvaged in loose form. They later got gathered up and, um, and bound together as a book of commandments. But that publishing effort in independence was abandoned because of the mobs and the destruction of the press. So in 1835, they published the Doctrine and Covenants in Kirtland. Well, the Doctrine and Covenants contained, as its very first section, the um, Lectures on Faith. A committee was appointed to deal with the Revelations, the Book of Commandments material. Joseph Smith was part of that committee, but apparently didn't contribute. His diaries say that he spent his time editing and correcting Lectures on Faith. There are those who say that lectures on faith appear to be the product of uh, Sidney Rigdon and not Joseph Smith because they did word comparisons. Joseph Smith, before the publication of Doctrine and Covenants, spent his time editing and correcting lectures on faith. When he finished with that, and that is apparently the only thing he worked on getting ready for the Doctrine and Covenants to be printed, he said he would vouch for the correctness of the doctrine that is contained in what he had done, that he would stand by every word of it. That portion in the front of the DNC is the doctrine. The covenants are the revelations. Well, the committee that was working on the revelations included Sidney Rigdon, and he took even more liberties than had Oliver Cowdery with revelations that had come to Joseph. And so what you have in the LDS version of the Doctrine and Covenants are two steps removed from the original revelation to Joseph. And what is in the Teachings and Commandments is a chronological layout that includes lectures on faith, that um, 
insofar as we are able to accurately do so, recaptures exactly what the original revelation was and um, states it as near as we can get at present um, comprehensively, chronologically, and accurately in the form that it came as a revelation to Joseph Smith. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Denver Snuffer. In our next conversation, we're going to continue to talk about the scriptures, especially the Book of Mormon. Denver Snuffer says that John Gilbert, who was the printer for the Book of Mormon, incorrectly punctuated it and made it sound Trinitarian. I'm saying you can repunctuate it. The, the Book of Mormon in the LDS version is still John Gilbert's punctuation. Mm -hmm. Today, the LDS church is living with John Gilbert's punctuation. We're not. Uh, and it's easy to repunctuate and to reach a different result. I've given a talk on this, and there's, mm. the, uh, there's stuff out there that, that will demonstrate what I'm talking about, if you're interested, or yeah. someone listening is interested. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe to patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And for just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview without any interruption. If you'd like a paperback version of our transcripts, go to Amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents Interview. Also, if you'd like to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website, and I'll be able to send you a transcript as soon as they are completed, and click the subscribe button. You can also find our latest information on Facebook.com slash Gospel Tangents, as well as we're on Twitter at Gospel Tangents. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. The link is at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents, and you can subscribe there. Also, please give us a five-star review. If you want to support all of the podcasts as part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, go to lyceum.fm, that's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M, and do a search for Dialogue Podcast Network or Gospel Tangents, because, you know, that's a pretty cool one, too. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some of our great videos. Thanks again.